encourage you if you come back tonight, um, bring a test. We had testimonies last Sunday night, and they worked out pretty well. But I encourage you to uh, bring um, a testimony of something you've got from your Bible reading. So if you got something from your Bible reading, uh, go ahead and bring that tonight before the, the teaching on life of Christ. All right, turn to Job chapter 25. We're going to read a whole chapter this morning before we get into it. Job chapter 25. <clears throat> All of you are scared until you get to Job 25. <laughs> you find out there's only, there's only six verses in Job 25. <clears throat> you're like, oh boy. Aren't you glad I didn't say we're going to read a whole chapter, turn to Psalms 119? So you're welcome. I'm nice. All right. <clears throat> Job 25, this is uh, one of uh, Bildad, uh, one of Job's friends, uh, who at first was a good comforter. There's only a couple of verses in Job chapter 2 that relate to him being a good comforter. And they came for a couple of weeks and were with, his, with him and sat with him. And then they opened their mouths. And later on he calls them miserable comforters. Miserable comforters. But it doesn't mean that everything they say is wrong. Um, there's some uh, things that he says here or they say in the chapters to Job that they weren't on point necessarily, but they weren't necessarily wrong. And uh, this verse jumps out to me today, and it says in Job, turn me down just a touch. I feel like I'm just a little too high here. Job 25, then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies, and upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can a man be justified with God, or how can he then, how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Think about that in contrast to God. You see a star out there, and it, it has no morality. It's just a star. Uh, and it really, when you read Genesis chapter 1, I think it's an amazing thing when he makes the stars. It talks about the heaven and the earth and the universe, you know, basically. And it says, and he made the stars also. Um, but yet, we see him out there, and they make beautiful nights, you know, uh, lights in the night sky. But uh, he says that they're not even pure in comparison to our God. Now look at the next verse, and this is where I want to focus in. How much less man that is a what? A worm, and the son of man, which is a worm. Now I don't know about you, but I don't like being called names. <laughs> uh, and I don't even, even if they're justly due, right? Uh, if somebody calls you something and you're like, yeah, you know, that's not true, and somebody calls you something and you're like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I probably need to change that around. I don't, I've never been called a worm before, except when I open my Bible, and then the Bible, Bildad says, hey, we're a worm. We're a worm. And uh, so I want to give you some things here. A worm is an animal that typically is a long, cylinder-like, tube-like bodies with no limbs or eyes. Now, not a, some of the worms that we're going to talk about here in the Bible are not exactly that, but a worm is what you would expect it to be. It just kind of looks, uh, it's a nasty little thing, right? Nobody likes to... Uh, I'm going to, you know, what does it say? Nobody likes me. I'm going to go out and eat worms or something like that. Not really necessarily we think about worms in a very positive content. And, and obviously Bildad here is not relating to worms. I mean, he could have, imagine if somebody else was writing a Bible. Bildad, you know, how much more man like a butterfly, <laughs> you know, or like a parrot or like a lion. No, no, he goes to the lowest, even subterranean animal and says man is likened unto a worm. Mm, interesting. Worms vary in size from microscopic, which is ones you don't want to have, amen? <laughs> microscopic thread worms, you know, ones you just can't see, but they're there, living creature, to over three feet in length for marine bristle worms. How many of you ever had a, a, uh, a saltwater aquarium? Anybody ever had a saltwater aquarium? All right. Did you have bristle worms at all in them? Did you have live coral? Yeah. Yeah, you don't know, you buy live coral and you don't really realize it until night comes out or one of your fish dies and he's floating and you're like, I'll get to him tomorrow and you come back tomorrow and you eat no fish to get to. And then you come down there and you got yourself a flashlight or a light and you, know, so you flip the light on. I had a saltwater aquarium, about big 55 one, five gallon one down in the parsonage years ago and I had saltwater fish in there and I had different things in there and most of them died because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but uh, uh, when they did die, when they did die, they never were found. You say, why? Inside the live coral that I got at Bob's Fish Place over here were things called bristle worms. And, okay, bristle. I'm over 40. Any of you ever played with bristle blocks when you were a kid? No? Lincoln logs? 
Did you know Lincoln? Or just, okay. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> Bristle blocks. My grandma had them. Maybe they're way before my time. And they, they had little blocks and like Legos, but they have little things that stick out. And you put them together, and man, we'd make things just like you would with Legos. And uh, they were bigger. And that's kind of what a bristle worm looked like. It had little sticky things all over it, and it would go across the bottom of our tank. And, and we had a ton of them. I had to get in there and clean them out because they would just take over. But we had ones in there that would come out, and they were that long. I didn't know where they were living. <laughs> they would come out, and they were long, and they just kept growing. Well, I just kept feeding them dead fish accidentally, but, you know, <laughs> needless to say, those were small ones. But you think about it, 3.3 feet long, a bristle worm. And don't worry, it's in the saltwater ocean. You're probably never going to see one in real life. Um, that's small in comparison to the African giant earthworm. He, can get, he usually is 4.5 feet long and can get up to 22 feet long and weigh almost four pounds. That is crazy. You would think he was a snake, <laughs> right? <laughs> Good fishing, you might catch a whale with that one. <laughs> 22 feet long, and he is microscopic in compar comparison to the bootlace worm. Now, bootlace worm is only about yay big. It's very small. It's, it's probably not even as wide as my finger. It's, it's e much smaller than that. But there was one in 1864 after a storm by St. Andrew, Scotland, that washed up on the beach. It was more than 180 feet long. 180 feet long, longer than the biggest jellyfish, which is the longest animal in the, uh, I can't remember what they call the jellyfish, but longest animal in the ocean. Worms vary in sizes, don't they? Aren't you glad you just have to worry about night crawlers? <laughs> uh, you know, and what we have done with worms, I mean, they're pretty gross. When I talk about some of the things in the Bible, it's not like they get better just because the Bible's writing about them. So I'm going to go to some kind of nasty things in the Bible with the worm. It's not really going to be a very positive thing, but uh, I want you to understand that we have taken that worm and we have put it into a form, what we call, oh, where did I put it? Right over here. And this is for anybody that wants them after service. I will be at the back door called gummy worms. Amen? Oh, yeah. These things are great. Uh, you can even get them sour, you know. Um, that's amazing. These things are great. So especially for the kids in this room want some, but let me tell you, as an adult, I have a hard time walking past the gummy worm. I just do. I like them. So I got two big bags. Thank you, Dawn, for buying those for me. Those will be in the back, and we'll make sure that we get them to you. In fact, I'm going to put them over here right now, and uh, hopefully I'll remember to take them back there. <clears throat> Anyhow, but we've made, them, we've made worms edible. <laughs> You know, I'm not a fish. I've heard of people making these, you know, things. We're going to do a challenge to eat a worm. I I'm out. <laughs> I am not in. But you give me a gummy worm, man, I'm all in. In fact, they've made worms so edible, they put them in a dessert called worms and dirt. Anybody ever had that before? I don't know what that is, but that is good stuff. It's got Oreos crumbled across the top and some whipped cream, and those gummy worms are inside it. Good stuff. Good stuff. I don't need to eat too much worms and dirt, but amen. It's good stuff. But um, worms are not usually something that people think much about, unless you're like Dietrich. <laughs> Does anybody know what Dietrich likes to do? He likes to fish. I asked Dietrich today, yesterday, last night, I said, would you do me a favor? I said, would you bring to church some worms? And he went out, and he goes, all I got to do is bring my night crawlers. He already had them. He's probably got them all named. <laughs> you, say, you say, what are they for? Those worms right there are for catching a fish. I don't like the way Dietrich fishes, usually fishes and releases. I don't understand that. I like fishing and catching and eating, eating amen? But uh, Dietrich understands what he's doing. He's a fisherman, and he had these things on, on hand. These are pretty nasty. I, I was going to pull one out and play around with it and, you know, kind of gross people out, but I decided not to do that today. You're welcome. Would you like to do that? Lou, would you like to have a worm? <laughs> these ones are not going to be in the back for your consumption. I promise you that. We'll give these back to Dietrich at the end. Well, the Bible mentions worms. And uh, it is not something, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll get to do anything amazing here today. We'll put them right there. Don't get so sidetracked by the worms, if you don't mind. <laughs> but uh, uh, the Bible mentions worms, and most of the time it's not in a, a positive content. And uh, so I want to look at this today. I want to look at worms. And in connection to something uh, that it's going to be something that's connection to us, something that we're not going to be able to avoid at one, unless the rapture happens, all right? I think we understand what we're talking about. We'll get to it, show what the Bible says. I want to talk about worms after death, and I want to talk about the greatest form of a worm there ever was. It seems like a weird way to go this morning as I preach on worms, but the Bible mentions it, and so we're going to look at worms today. It's kind of a gross one, but 
I'm glad you're here today to endure it with me. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get to the message. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for the opportunity we have. God, you've, uh, like Solomon, Lord, he looked at all of God's creatures and nature and he wrote uh, 4,000, I think it was, Proverbs on different things of nature that you had made. And uh, Lord, you mentioned worms. Worms are obviously something that Bildad was familiar with and that mankind has been around for thousands and thousands, ever from creation, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And Lord, they're beneath our feet. Lord, they're around us and uh, probably not something that we necessarily see. But I pray, God, that today when we see a worm, our mindset would change a little bit, not towards the texture or the grossness of the animal, but Lord, towards the thought of what the Bible says. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us, Lord, this morning, especially with me and my heart, my spirit, as I bring this across. Part of this message is uh, very hard to preach because it's got a very dark uh, content to it. But at the same time, God, there is light in the end. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us, God, to look around at nature. Lord, sometimes I might preach a message on, on different animals, and I have done that before here. Uh, but, Lord, today it's worms. And God, I thank you for making them. I thank you, God, that these worms off to my right, Lord, have been made for your pleasure. And they don't do anything to disappoint you at all. And, God, we can. And so I, I ask, Father, we would learn from this thought on worms this morning. And, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified. And, God, we get something from your word to apply it to our life. Lord, if there's one that's not saved in this room today, today is the day of salvation. Help them not to put that off. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Grab your Bible and turn all the way to the New Testament to the book of Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. <clears throat> Worms have a major connection with death. I think we understand that. It is uh, one of those things that, you know, you really can't stop what's going to happen. But here is kind of a supernatural connection with death and worms in a, weird, in a way. Herod was uh, a king and he was well known and he was a good speaker. Uh, and uh, it says this in verse 20 in Acts chapter 12, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. Understand why they wanted peace. They, they understand, Herod, we can't have problems with you because you give us substance, uh, sustenance. So we want to make sure that we're good with you. We've made your friend our friend, and we're going to give you uh, the platform now to speak. And so he does. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, and not of a man. Now, it was not the voice of a god. And I understand motivational speaking, and I understand giving, I understand uh, the, you know, being pushed by people and encouraged by some. But what Herod was doing was definitely not the voice of of a God. And I'll tell you this one thing, God does not like competition for his position. He will not stand for it. Uh, he's put up with it for so long, and he will put up with it, we know, for at least uh, a little while longer, but he does not like when he, a human, that is like a worm, <laughs> according to Bildad, is given God-like status. Uh, immediately, verse 23, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And look what it says. And it was eaten, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Think about that. Now, I know maybe he was eaten of worms later, but it says he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. It says he gave up the ghost after he was eaten of worms. Woo. Makes you wonder what was going on inside his body that he didn't know that God just said, release the worms. Not release the hounds, but release the worms. And as he stood there, immediately, when he should have said, no, 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 to God be the glory, he did not. And he let his pride swell in. And by pride cometh destruction, as we've heard before. And the Bible says he was eating worms. Makes you wonder what he was putting into his body. It's not a nutritional message here at all, because I'm talking about eating worms and dirt earlier, so don't worry about that. Makes you wonder what he was putting into his body that the Lord knew, and boom, he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. Right in front of those people. That is a semi-miracle. Not really necessarily the ones that you want to think about. There, the, anybody know what the hearse song is? You all do. You used to call it, now it used to be called the hearse song. Now we call it the worms crawl in. <laughs> the hearse song uh, used to be very popular in World War I with American and British soldiers. They would sing it. The hearse song, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. You say, what did it have to do with death? All those bodies they would see and 
The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, and that's what those people envisioned. Throughout the book of Job and throughout the Bible, worms are mentioned in connection with human death. In Job it says, And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. He says again, Drought and heat consume the snow water, so doth the grave those which have sinned. The womb shall forget him, the worm shall feed sweetly on him. He shall be no more remembered, and wickedness shall be broken as a tree. Isaiah says, The pomp is brought down, thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Ugh! Sounds disgusting, doesn't it? Sounds like some kind of show. It's like fear factor. You know, you've got to try to get out of something covered by worms. I don't care about worms. They don't really bother me, but I have no desire to have them on me at all. Yet the Bible says that death comes and, hey, the worms cover you. There's just nothing you can get around about that. Now I want to show you verse 24. As soon as Herod was removed out of the way, as soon as that man who took the place of God was removed, it says verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. You know, we have to get out of the way. We, you know, we should remember who we are and our status in front of God. If the stars are impure in the sight of God, how much less man who is likened unto a worm and the son of man who is like a worm? You know, I am nothing today except for Jesus Christ and for what he's done. I am a worm, and that's about it. And if there's anything good about me, it has to do with what he did for me. It has nothing to do with what I have done for me. Just remember that we need to remember where, what worms are connection, connected to in our life or in our death. Now I want to go a little bit darker here. I'm not exactly what I want to do, but I want to go darker here because I have to. Look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, <clears throat> this morning, a worm is mentioned three times almost in a row consecutively here, split up by a couple of verses in Mark chapter 9. And uh, before I read these verses, I have read, you know, multiple, multiple new versions have removed two of these verses out of there. So if I say flip to Mark chapter 9, verse 44, and verse 46 and verse 48, you'll only find verse 48 in your Bible if you don't have a King James. They've removed verse 44 and 46. Makes you wonder why. Makes you wonder if they're scared of something. <laughs> but uh, uh, the Bible says in verse 44, 46, and 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Say, so what is it in context with? Look at verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, for it is better to thee to enter into life maim. He said, it's better for you to live without one hand than having two hands to go into where? Say it again. That's a reality, folks. That is not a figment of somebody's imagination. Hell is real. And he says it is better for you to go into life, live your life with one hand, than have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 44, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, and for it is better for thee to be, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. For uh, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, for it is better to thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I think Jesus is trying to get across a very harsh but real uh, reality of life after death. <laughs> Life after death. The Bible says it's not just where the worm. Many of the new versions that have left the verse in there in verse 48 have changed it to where the worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. But what does the King James say? Their worm dieth not and the fire. This gets very personal where he says their worm. Who is he referring to? In verse 44 he's referring to the they in verse 43. In verse 46, he's referring to the people in verse 45. In verse 48, he's referring to the people in verse 47. He is referring to their worm in hell fire. Look at Revelation chapter 20. So, Pastor, it's not very encouraging. Well, listen, if you're saved in this room today, it's, not, it's just a Bible study, amen? Uh, there ain't nothing about this message that made me lose sleep except for trying to make sure it gets across with an uh, adequate understanding. Uh, I did not lay asleep last, or lay, lay awake last night thinking, I wonder if my worm will be in hell one day. No, not at all. I didn't worry about that. October 13th, 1985, I got that thing taken care of. <laughs> but look what it says in Revelation chapter 20. It says, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. He talks about hell in Mark chapter 9. Where's hell? Hell's beneath your feet. The Bible says that in Isaiah. Hell from beneath hath moved to meet us. Hell is beneath us, but the lake of fire will not be. The lake of fire will be on the earth. And I'll show you where that will be and when that will be. It says, in death and hell, after that great, at that great white throne, those that are, who, who's, who were, who are names are not found written in the book of life will be judged. And the Bible says this, in death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, it's got to be a bunch of bad people. Oh, it is. Go one chapter over, chapter 21, verse 8. What kind of people are they? Fearful. I don't mean like COVID fearful or spider fearful or clowns fearful, okay? I mean, anybody got, don't, don't raise your hand if you have a fear of clowns, but some people do. Uh, I'm not talking about height fearful. He's not talking about that. This is more deeper than that. It's a spiritual stuff. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers. I don't, don't raise your hand on that one, amen. <laughs> and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Well, I thought it was all bad people. Well, guess what? You know what I've done before? I've lied. One lie makes a person a liar. Where does those liars go? Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've had somebody, I heard somebody say one time, and I've had to answer this question many times, how could a loving God put somebody in hell? I usually answer it, a just God does. He gives you the out. He gives you the option, the free gift of salvation. And if we reject that free gift, he has no other option but to allow sin to take its natural course. Listen, it wasn't a just God necessarily that put us in hell. We were already on our way to hell. It was a loving God who made a way so we would not have to be a worm in hell and eventually stand in front of him in front of the great white throne and then be cast into the lake of fire as a worm. You say, I don't understand this. A worm? Not like a worm. Maybe a worm without arms or legs, but definitely not a worm without eyes. You say, why? Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, the rich man lifted up his eyes. And he says, send Lazarus. He had a mouth and a tongue. He said, send Lazarus. You say, what happens when somebody dies and goes to hell? Well, they're in torment. I don't like talking about it, to be honest with you, but it's needful. They're in pain and they're in suffering. They're in anguish. They're in fire. It's not pitch black like we've always assumed because he could see across. It's bad. It's not a place like the world has painted it out, even in cartoons from years and years ago. Looney Tunes did a great injustice, making heaven boring as we sit on clouds playing harps and hell look like fun. Actually, vice versa. There's things in Revelation chapter 22 about eternity that me and you don't even understand that is going to be absolutely awesome. And hell will be just that. It will be hell. It will be no fun whatsoever for the person. One second after hell, they'll, real, they'll wish they could go back, to he, back on earth. They'll wish that they would have somebody send them to their family. And that rich man, when he died, he went to hell. You say, but my body can't withstand it. Exactly. Just like your earthly body cannot withstand the glories of God above, he has to change a person from their vile body unto a glorious body like Paul talks about in Philippians. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 that in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, we shall put off this corruption, this mortal, and take on immortality. As the Bible says, John said this, that we shall see him... For we shall be like him as he is. In order for us to be able to spend eternity in heaven with God, he translates us like he did Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. He changes the body so that it can withstand the glories of heaven. And your body could not withstand the suffering of hell. So he does the same thing. He allows a transformation into that of a worm. A worm. A man one time took a... Worm can also be snakes, reptiles can be called worms. Anything without arms and legs can be called a worm. They can be referenced that way. I've told the story before about a man who killed some rattlesnakes and cut the heads off them and threw the bodies into a trash, you know, to a burning barrel. 
Five days they sat out there in the sun down in Texas. Five days they sat out there, and then he went out and burnt some stuff, and he lit that thing on fire, and he said he went inside and he was washing his hands, and he looked out across that, that, that backyard, and there was that burning barrel just flopping back and forth, and he's like, what in the world is going on? He walked over to that burning barrel, and he looked in, and he said those bodies of those headless snakes were writhing in the flames. I don't know what it's going to be like, and I'll never know what hell is going to be like. You say, why? Well, because of another worm that we'll talk about here in just a second. But where will this lake of fire be? Look at Isaiah chapter 66. Mark, when he wrote, where their worm dieth not, their fire is not quenched, does what often a New Testament writer would do is he was reading somewhere in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah chapter 66. This is during the millennial reign, and if you understand the millennial reign of Christ, before the millennial reign of Christ, there is a great battle. What's it called? Armageddon. And at the end of that battle, the devil gets put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And the false prophet and the beast are thrown into the lake of fire. That means on the earth, they will be in that lake of fire. It is in the valley of Megiddo. It is outside of Jerusalem. After the thousand years are over, the devil is released, released for a little time. He goes and deceives the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog comes up against Jerusalem. Fire comes out of heaven. Boom, devours everybody. God takes the devil and then throws him into the lake of fire, which will continue to be on the earth. The Bible says this is a fire that burneth forever. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. But while they're on the earth, during that reign of Christ, from all over, during his dominant kingdom, his kingdom without end, without borders, people will come from all over to worship before the Lord. And it says that in verse 23. And Isaiah has got 66 chapters, which mirrors in its theme, verse, chapter 66, Revelation which is your 66th book of the Bible. Look what it says in verse 23. And it came to pass that from one new moon to another, and one from Sabbath to another, look, you go back under a different rule, a Jewish Shemitic rule, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. He's sitting on a throne of David, as was promised to him to marry from the, by the time Gabriel came to her. He shall sit on the throne of his father David forever. And there he is in Jerusalem, and he's sitting there on the throne, and all flesh for those a thousand years are going to come, and they're going to worship before him. And look what it says in verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. You say, where will they be? In the lake of fire. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be in whoring of all men. rough when you think about it, that in that lake of fire may be workers of yours, maybe family members that have a new body, but not an eternal one like God gives us, but a body that can withstand that torment and that pain. And they have eyes and a mouth, the Bible says, like the rich man did in hell, but I wonder what they're saying. I wonder if you'd recognize them. As you walk to glorify the Lord, having thanked God for what he's done for you, and you look down, and there's those worms in that fire, and their worm in that fire that shall not be quenched. I wonder what they're going to say. Get me out. Is there any go? Can I, get a, can I get a redo? Maybe it'll just be a lot of squeaking, and we'll walk by, and maybe... Pray, hopefully it'll be unrecognizable and we won't know what's going on, but it'll be there as an abhorring to all flesh. And as we walk to glorify the greatest king this world will ever know, we'll go past one of the grossest, nastiest places this world will ever know. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Now, Psalms 22. Psalms 22 Say this this morning, if you're not saved in this room and that what I just told you scares you a little bit, good. Good. I don't mean to be frightful. I don't, I'm not coming across like a hammer. I want to come across tenderly because that's a very hard thing to hear. But praise the Lord, it doesn't end there. It does not have to end there for you. It will not end there for me. Psalms 22, verse 1 before I read it, in that passage that we started off in Job chapter 25, it, verse before, a couple of verses before he quotes men like a worm, Bildad, he says this, How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? In verse 6, how much less than a man 
that is a worm and the Son of Man, which is a worm. I, I don't know about you, but these guys over here can do nothing for me. <laughs> I mean, I know there's value to worms. If there wasn't, God wouldn't have made them. I, they, they do nothing for me. I don't need them in life. They're a worm. How in the world, if I am like that, and I can do nothing, can I be just before a pure God, who even the stars are impure in His sight? How can that happen? Well, we come to Psalms 22. People will go to hell one day and then lake a fire later on after the judgment because of their sins. But it doesn't have to be that way. Psalms 22, we come to verse 1, and we see immediately a prophetic chapter about the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This chapter, through its entirety, deals with the thought of what Christ went through on the cross. Verse 7 and 8, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, I mean, he's up there naked and bleeding and, and, and uh, his shame showing for everybody, and they're down here mocking him and making a ridicule of what he went through. Just like the psalmist says. Look at 12 and 13. There was a satanic influence going on. Obviously, at the Last Supper, Satan entered into Judas to deceive him. It says, Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. They've gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. You say, who is ever president? What present but not seen at the crucifixion was the devil. Oh, he was walking around. He was manipulating mankind. He was running the show without having been seen. Verse 15, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Jesus on that cross said, I thirst. And they ran and got gall, water mixed with vinegar for his, to quench his thirst. He was parched from the countless hours of the torture that he went through and then hanging in the sun. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. He was pierced for you and me. Verse 18, he was stripped naked. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They took his garments and they drew lots and they made a game of that purple robe that they put on him. He was forsaken by his father. Verse 19 and verse 1. Be not far from me, O Lord, my strength. O my strength, hasten thee to help me. Verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Everything you see here is a picture of the cross. Now, look at verses 14 and 16. I am poured out like water, which is true. They pierced him and out came water. And all my bones, how many bones? How about that? All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth in the midst of my bowels. Verse, uh, look at verse 17. I may tell, tell here is a, Word that means count, like a teller. I may tell all my bones. He could count them. For they look and stare upon me. I'll bet he looked, he did, in form, look different on the cross than the men next to him. You say, why? Because shortly after Christ gave up the ghost, they came and break the legs. This is what they would do in crucifixion because a man would be crucified and he would push up to breathe, but when he would go down like this, his lungs would swell, fill with blood and he would oftentimes just drown to death. So he would push up. So what they would do so he couldn't do this anymore is they would break his legs and the Bible prophesied that his legs, Jesus Christ's legs, would never be broken. It would never be broken. And he died before they could do that. They came to break his legs, but they broke the legs of the other men. That means they were informed, but Christ was like a worm. Not this beautiful, ornate picture that you often see people draw Christ on the cross. He was like a worm. All of his bones out of joint, hung there. In fact, look at verse 6. Christ on the cross. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. You know what he became? So we don't have to. A worm. Sin. 
When people die without Christ, they find themselves in hell and eventually in the lake of fire and in the form of a worm. But on the cross, Jesus Christ paid that penalty. He took that form that is reproachable and despised among men. All his bones out of joint. You know what the Bible says about the love of God toward mankind? For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So isn't it an amazing thing that Christ loved us enough to die in a shameful, reproachable way, in a form of something disgusting and detestable, and he did it for us. That song that we sang earlier, Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? It's a question. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? I like our hymn book. They haven't changed those words. A lot of them have. That, that wrong songwriter says, I know who I am, and I know why he died. The Bible says, For Christ has also suffered for sins the just, for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You say, but I, I understand he died for me. He took upon himself a form, his vicious, vicious, visage excuse me, was so marred that you would not recognize him, the Bible says in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected of man. He bore our sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Isaiah gives a very drastic picture of what Christ went through on the cross for us. He understands what death and sin and the penalty of it is and what we will go through if we have not trusted Jesus Christ. Now in this chapter, look at verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. You know what, thinking about, stop there for a second. I, I don't remember what it was like. I got saved at the age of five, so I don't know what it's like to pillow my head wondering if I'm going to die today and where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't. I can't remember. But there's such an affliction. People try to drown the reality of their future out before they hit the bed at night. With entertainment, or drugs, or alcohol, an illicit uh, lifestyle. They try to put away that thought of knowing, and as they get older, they get closer to it, and it's like, I can't stop this freight train from happening. It's an affliction, and he understands. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. You know what that means? Just like Paul wrote, he is still rich unto all that call upon him. Today, Today, you know what he can do today? Save even to the uttermost. You know what he can do today? You say, but he's been saving people for thousands of years. Yeah, and he still has not lost that power and that ability. He still has not turned his ear away. And our country and our people and our society and our world has gotten viler and wickeder. And, and they're glorying in it. And he still says, come unto me. <laughs> Verse 24, but when he cried unto him, he heard. The Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You say, Pastor, what you're speaking of this morning is not pleasant to hear. Neither is it pleasant to preach on, to be honest. I'd rather not. But I am not allowed to not preach on it. You say, it's scary. Yep. In Isaiah 41, verse 13 to 14, it says, For the Lord thy God will uphold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. He says this, Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. You say, I don't know if I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm, I'm nervous about it. I'm scared about that. What you said today is a great reality that I've not really thought about, and I've tried to put it out and not think about it. But now, to be confronted with having a new body, the Bible says, where their worm dieth not, this is too much. Fear not. Fear not. You say, why? Because whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. You say, but you don't know what I've done. i got to get clean before I can come to him. <laughs> really? You know what we're like? We're like worms. You know what they're in right now? Dirt. 
There ain't no getting that thing clean enough to ever be presentable to me. Ever. You don't know what I've done. I'm, I'm mixed up with the dirt of this world. I can't get clean. You don't have to. That's his job. He'll wash you with the water of the word. <laughs> he is the one that takes his righteousness and covers your unrighteousness so that the world is not on you anymore, and he puts his Holy Spirit inside of you, and he gives you, and he makes you a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things are become new. Never can a worm make itself presentable to me. Neither can man make itself presentable to God, who even the stars are impure in his sight. But Jesus Christ did it so that you can be righteous. You say, what do I do? Call upon him. Do you believe that he died for you? Do you believe you're a sinner? Do you believe you're going to hell? Call upon him. Ask him into your heart. Don't trust in your works. Don't come to church today did nothing but make you come to church today. I'm thrilled you're here. But this did not secure a place in heaven for you. Baptism does not secure a place in heaven. Church membership does not. You say, what does it? The death of Jesus Christ and belief and trust in that does. One day, those that have trusted the death, haven't trusted the death of Christ, like a worm, will forever be in the form of a worm in the lake of fire to remind them of what they've rejected. Mark said, where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. But those who have trusted and received the gift of God, the death of Christ for their sins, like Christ in, will live in heaven like Christ with a glorified body. You know what Job said? And though after my skin, worms destroy this body. And hey, you guys can have it. <laughs> when I'm dead, I don't need it anymore, and I'll feed you. Amen. <laughs> after this skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. If you're saved today, you get a new body, and it ain't nothing like those guys over there. It's going to be like him. And it isn't going to be like the one of the form of the crucified Son of God on the cross for sin. It's going to be like the glorified Savior who comes back in all of his power and stomps out the enemies beneath him. You are going to be like him, for you shall see him as he is. The question is, what body will you have? And it all hinges on what have you done with the man Christ Jesus. Have you asked him into your heart? Have you repented? I did. A long time ago. I never got over it. And I can't. <laughs> Have you? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. Worms. They're mentioned throughout the Bible and other things, but mostly it's in corruption. <laughs> it's usually not mentioned in a way that is positive. And usually it's in, a con in connection with death with death. There's no denying the reality of what we know will take place with this earthly form, but then to be confronted with what the Bible says today about our form of those that die without Christ, it is just that much more terrifying. But yet he, Jesus Christ, took all of that fear and terror and reproach that you if you're lost in this room today, have coming to you. He did it 2,000 years ago so that you never have to feel that way. Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Is there anybody in this room that would be honest? No one's looking around. Who would raise their hand and say, I'm not sure. I'm not, promise you, I'm not calling you out and I'm not even going to come to you. I'm not going to bother you. Just say, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% certain that I'm saved. Here's my hand. Amen. Thank you. Very honest. You can put your hand down. It took a lot of courage. I'm praying for you. If you're saved in this room today, there's going to be a lot of people. I fear more people in hell than in heaven. But we can do our part. Man, we got a blessing coming. <laughs> we get to be like Christ. But they don't know about the, what I just talked about. And the only way they're going to know is if we tell them.
With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the piano begins to play. The Lord's dealt with you this morning, and you need to deal with God. You can deal with him there in your seat, but you can come forward and talk to God.